Now, this can actually lead to increased leakiness in your blood vessels, changes in mucus in your throat, nose, any, any orifice in the body, and it causes an increased discharge of more histamine in the body, more serotonin, which can lead to more interleukin-6, prolactin, cause your body to waste calcium, lose sodium, etc. Now, as I mentioned, histamine binds to H1 receptors in the lower bronchioles, H2 receptors in the upper bronchioles, vasoconstriction, vasodilation. So it might give you that pseudo-illusion that it's alleviating your asthma, but if it really did the trick, you wouldn't constantly need your inhaler. I had asthma when I was a child, played hockey. I had asthma so bad. I was in and out of the hospital almost every week. I was on inhalers, medication, shots, everything. And the interesting thing is, when I started getting into the health industry and changed my diet, asthma is completely gone. I don't have asthma anymore. So you can see that if you do the right thing for your body, you can easily alleviate these hyperventilation-like symptoms that are happening at the cell level. Because it's not a surfacey thing. Your body's showing you what's going on at the cell level. At the same time, Ray talks about how a simple protein deficiency can lead to estrogen dominance, which can lead to asthmatic-like symptoms. Now, protein deficiency, how much people take in at each meal at the end of the day, it's all person-specific. So it's hard for me to say, but I would say depending on, I would say the average person, the maximum amount you want to take in is 120 grams. Now this is just generalizing, because I do have some people that take way more than that. But I'm not working with you, so that's just a general recommendation. Now if you look at C-reactive protein, this is an inflammatory marker that most of the Western medicine looks at in order to say you're actually in an inflammatory state. We use body temperature and pulse. It's much easier, it's much cheaper. They use C-reactive protein testing. Now, C-reactive protein is a protein synthesized in the liver in response to factors released by, by adipocytes. Now, adipocytes are fat cells, fat tissue. Now, estrogen is stored and released in adipocytes. Interesting fact there. When you're inflamed, weight gain, obesity, that's actually an inflammatory response. C-reactive protein is actually found in the blood. Levels rise with inflammation, of course. And a lot of the times, a lot of people don't know this, they actually develop C-reactive protein will rise in regards to bacterial overgrowth, which are very common in people that are hypothyroid or have a hypometabolic metabolism, viral infections, fungal infections from not regulating blood sugar and being in an immune suppressed state, as well as parasites. So there's many reasons why you have C-reactive protein and you're inflamed. But the bottom line is, stuff's happening at the cell level. We have to regulate that. So if you do have a parasitic infection, you can treat it, but your body has a foundation or at least has something to work from physiologically. Now at the same time, interleukin-6, like I talked about a little bit prior, interleukin-6 is released from inflamed tissues. Now interleukin-6 triggers the release of C-reactive protein in the body and fibrinogen by the liver. You can make that correlation from exercise or from doing too much that a body can't handle, or from producing too much cortisol and being in an inflamed state. The interesting fact is estrogen itself can actually stimulate the release and the oversynthesis of fibrinogen and C-reactive protein. An interesting study he talks about, and I can't remember if it was done in humans, hamsters, or, or an animal, but the bottom line is he talks about allergies. He talks about how the nervous system reflexes are exaggerated by stressors such as hypoglycemia, not regulating blood sugar, which is basically being in a hypometabolic state. And there was an experiment done where they put a balloon in the small intestine and found that when a person had basically uh, normal blood sugar, regulated blood sugar, they had no sort of allergen, no histamine production, no serotonin production, no irritation, no inflammation optimal oxygen production, blood, blood circulation, etc. But when the person or the animal had the balloon inflamed and they were hypoglycemic, they had a huge nervous system reflex and had a huge um, release of inflammation, inflammatory compounds such as serotonin and histamine. They had a lot of ischemia and lack of oxygen going to these tissues. So you can see how regulating blood sugar itself can help you not only with asthma, but with so many other conditions. Now, I'm not saying it's the end-all, be-all, but it's the very foundation your physiology needs to actually allow you to heal itself with everything else you're doing with your healing puzzle. 
Another thing that you can look at in regards to looking at to see if you maybe have asthma-like symptoms is looking at your blood lab. You can look at eosinophils. These remove the breakdown in products of protein catabolism. So if you're hypothyroid, you have a slow metabolism, you're eating a lot of muscle meats, you're not breaking them down, you have dysbiosis, you get bacterial overgrowth, your eosinophil is going to go up. And if you're hypometabolic, you're typically estrogen dominant or progesterone deficient, and you're in an inflamed state releasing histamine, which can lead to a lot of asthmatic-like symptoms. At the same time, I already talked about carrageenan, I already talked about increased insulin exacerbating asthma, I already talked about sulfites increasing asthma. Another interesting fact is estrogen wastes B6. Now, B6 is important in the body for many reasons. One of them, your liver actually needs it to release glycogen. And this is very important when it comes to regulating cell metabolism. Now, estrogen wastes B6 in the body, and it can cause immune system suppression, leading to bacterial overgrowth and fungal overgrowth, typically a sign of immune system suppression. B6 is considered what's called... Um, a, phospho, a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, just like a lot of the inhalers that asthmatic use. They're phosphodiesterase inhibitors to downregulate histamine. So if we can downregulate estrogen and upregulate B6, either with supplementation or food, or just downregulating uh, estrogen will indirectly raise B6, we can use B6 as a phosphodiesterase inhibitor and downregulate histamine, alleviating a lot of this vasoconstriction and histamine production in the body. Just like salt, salt is a natural antihistamine. Beside downregulating adrenaline, salt is great because it's a natural antihistamine and it helps to regulate inflammation in the body. Another important thing to look at is, on a physical level, is ribs. Now there's so many other things to look at, but we'll keep it simple. When you breathe, you have bucket handle movement of the ribs like this, and you have what are called pump arm movements of the ribs like this, up and down. Bucket handle happen at the sternochondral joint. You get this in, um, with inhalation, the cartilage goes inferior, the ribs go superior. And the, the pump arm movements happen at the costochondral joints, and those more internally, externally rotate. So if someone has rib or a rib or ribs lesioned in inhalation, meaning they're locked here and they won't go down when you exhale, or a, um, their lesion downward, a rib or many ribs, so when you inhale they won't go up and they'll go down, so their lesion one or the other, that can cause a restriction in how we breathe. Because when you breathe, you need to increase the AP diameter, the transverse diameter, etc. of the thorax so you can actually take in air. So I find a lot of people with first rib subluxations or lesions in the bucket handle ribs or the sternochondral joints actually have asthmatic-like symptoms when they don't really have asthma. Same thing with the pleura of the lung, the pleural dome, the connections to C6, 7, T1 through the vertebral pleural ligaments, costal pleural ligaments, and transverse pleural ligaments. A lot of people call that Simpson's fascia. So you can have issues with the vertebrae, the fascia, those attached to the pleural dome. Any type of tension there in the pleura, any of those things can actually cause asthmatic-like symptoms. So always get the physical body you know, accessed as well, and not only nutritional, because there's many pieces to the healing puzzle, and as I say, we have to figure out why you have asthma. Maybe you have asthma because it's a structural thing and it's not a physiological thing. So think about these things when you're getting treated. Other things that I got from his newsletter, if we think about what is protective, now we're getting to the protective part of it. We talked about you know, what can cause it, what is protective. Ray feels that caffeine, thyroid, progesterone, carbon dioxide, like altitude, he talks about how at high altitude there's actually a less prevalence of asthma, secondary to a decrease in inflammation because of the increased CO2 that we're taking in. Now when you hyperventilate or you're asthmatic, you lose CO2. Most people that are hypothyroid are hyperventilating. When you lose CO2, you alter how our cells breathe. Now, the interesting correlation Ray made, he talked about altitude sickness. People with altitude sickness, they usually fix it by giving them more carbon dioxide or asthma-like drugs. So this just goes to show us that asthma is a carbon dioxide deprivation. We're not producing enough carbon dioxide. Now, I'm not saying go breathe in a brown bag or go move to the high mountains. All I'm saying is these things can be beneficial for people with asthma or anyone to regulate how our cells are actually breathing. 
caffeine because caffeine on many levels, if used correctly, I've done a YouTube on that, can actually regulate cell metabolism. Thyroid from the foods we eat, regulating thyroid production, allowing for its conversion will allow our cells to produce more carbon dioxide, which will decrease histamine and all these inflammatory markers. And lowering serotonin in the body, a very therapeutic for asthma. How do we lower serotonin? Of course, there's drugs people can take, you know, the supplements people recommend. But at the same time, if you regulate inflammation, you regulate cell metabolism, and you decrease the amount of tryptophan you're taking in your diet, because tryptophan turns into serotonin, serotonin is inflammatory, and it suppresses the thyroid and cell metabolism, we can reduce the amount of serotonin production in the body. Most of it, 95%, according to Constance Martin, is actually produced in the gut. And it's produced in response to toxins, bacterial overgrowth, and inflammation, that allergic response. So if we eliminate or cut down on muscle meats or foods that are high in tryptophan, we can reduce serotonin, which is highly excitatory, and can lead to oxygen deprivation at the cell level and asthmatic-like symptoms. He talks about eucalyptus oil, whether put on the chest or ingested, contains what's called cineol, C-I-N-E-O-L-E, -E, which actually can inhibit unsaturated fat metabolism, as well as inhibit cytokine production, so using this can actually downregulate a lot of the histamine production in the body. Now, by itself, is it going to work? No, you have to eliminate unsaturated fats for it to work. But it's just another adjunct that you can use. What I find which benefits most of my clients is filling up a sink with hot water, putting in some eucalyptus oil, putting a towel over their head, and just having the steam go into their body. They can sit there for 5 to 10 minutes breathing it in, doing some type of like steam bath to the face ingesting or inhaling the eucalyptus oil to help the body inhibit all these inflammatory markers that it's releasing. Of course, you can correlate this directly or indirectly. Adequate in, um, intake of protein, adequate intake of the right types of fruits and sugars, eating foods that are high in magnesium, such as pulp for your own juice, using vitamin E from the foods that we eat or supplementing if needed because vitamin E is protective against unsaturated fats, and it's anti-estrogenic. And at the same time, utilizing coconut oil in your diet, especially when you have asthma, because co coconut oil actually reduces our need for vitamin E, which is super important. But at the same time, it can actually help the body detoxify from unsaturated fats. And at the same time, coconut oil is actually a natural antihistamine. Lower histamine, reduce your asthmatic-like symptoms. Of course, reducing starches in your diet and unsaturated fats and probably one of the most important things is increasing the amount of gelatin that you're taking in. Gelatin is absent of tryptophan. Ray talks about this. Constance Martin talks about this. But 22% of its content is glycine. Now, glycine does many things for the body. It helps the GI system produce hydrochloric acid. It helps the liver with phase 2 detoxification. I mean, the list goes on. But one of the main things it does is it can actually protect the lungs and other organs from toxins and, flame, and other inflammatory agents from histamine, serotonin, etc. So this was a long YouTube clip. I hope, hope you enjoyed part one and two, and I'm out of here.